try, you know, try to learn it as we go along. It, it, what happened was is that there was a young preacher, and I don't know why he's young. A lot of people pick on young preachers. When I was a young preacher, I hated that. There was an old preacher, my age, and he went to, uh, he went to talk to a pastor search committee, and they said, well, you know what's really, really important to us is that you know your Bible. I mean, that's what's important. We can talk about all this other stuff, but we need you to know your Bible. And he said, uh, they said, uh, he said, well, I, I know my Bible now. And they said, well, you know, we, we know you do, and we believe you, but do you, do you mind telling us some like maybe your favorite Bible story? He said, well, sure, I'll tell you my favorite Bible story. There was a certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and the thorns nearly choked him half to death. And he said, I will arise and go to my father's house. And he came down the road until he came to a sycamore tree. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, and he waited to get well. About that time, King Sodom and Queen Gomorrah oh, no. came along and said, Hey, fella, won't you come on down from that tree, and we'll rub some salt in your wounds. And so he came down out of the tree, and they rubbed some salt in his wounds. It took him down to Tarsus, where Moses was about to get on the ark. <laughs> and they said, here, you take care of him, and when we come back, we'll repay you for a fold. So they got out there on the water, and all of a sudden, a big storm came up, and they threw him overboard. And about that time, a big fish came and swallowed him up. And he stayed in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. The fish finally spit him out on dry ground. He said, this time I'm taking a shortcut through the woods. And while he was running through the woods, his long hair got caught in a tree. And he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights until his barber, Delilah, came along and said, by this time he stinketh. And so she went ahead and cut him down, and he got back on the Damascus Road until he came to a wall where some men were arguing with this woman. And it was Jezebel. And so he said to them, Wait, well, hey boys, why don't you chunk her down? And they said, how many times should we chunk her down? Up to seven times? And he said, nay, but seven times, 70 times. And when they chunked her down 490 times, she burst asunder in their midst. And when they picked up the fragments, they had 12 baskets. <laughs> now, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? <laughs> Well, the chairman of the pulpit committee, he said, Well, boys, I think we ought to call him. He sure knows his Bible. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking at 2 Timothy, Bible alone. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. And then you'll be going to the next chapter, chapter 3 to verse 15. And so uh, what these two texts have in common is the Bible itself, the Word of God. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with 14, let's all stand together as we read God's Word. Of these things, put them in remembrance, is Paul talking to Timothy, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And in chapter 3, beginning with verse 15, Paul talking to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for many blessings. And God, once again, we heard of several families that's lost loved ones. And we pray, God, for your Holy Spirit to comfort them. We especially pray for the Swain family. And God, how we thank you for what uh, Richard and his wife have brought to Cowboy Church and the foundation that they've laid for us. And God, we pray that uh, you would help us to honor them in this time. 
We pray, Lord, that you would bless the reading of your word tonight. How we thank you for it. Lift, uh, lift, uh, lift us up, Father, as, you, as we study your word tonight. Uh, help us to understand it. Help us to perceive it. Help us, Lord, to apply it to our life. God, how we pray for your blessings on this church. God, continue to put a hedge of protection around the church, around the rodeo pen. Bless our times together, Lord, for we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, uh, what does the text say? Paul was Timothy's spiritual mentor. He even calls himself his father in the ministry. He calls Timothy his son in the ministry. He's writing from prison some of his last letters. So Paul tells Timothy in these two texts, the Word of God is ultimate. The Word of God is important. The Word of God is what we need. We want to talk tonight about the Word of God alone. I told you all ago, we're talking about faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, the Word alone. These things go back to Reformation. There's nothing I've ever come up with. Uh, but these are things that, that really became important, and they still are important. And to me, those four foundations is what we got to stand on theologically. So here is the first one, the Word alone. The big idea is that we base what we believe on the Word of God. So we want five top truths, or five of the most important things that we could say about the Word of God alone. Only the Word of God is inspired. Now, I can tell you that nobody has had more fun preaching at Cowboy Church or at any church as I've had at Cowboy Church. I'm telling you, man, I've had many good times. Boy, some of these sessions we've had have felt like a pep rally. And so therefore, I must tell you tonight, I can almost guarantee you that I'm going to say something that you're not going to like. Okay. And I can almost guarantee you I'm going to say something that you're not going to agree with. But in my correct and humble opinion, <laughs> we're going to study what the Word of God is all about. And the first thing we want to say, and look, people say, you know, uh, people, you know, might, might, might look at it on the surface, but we act like other stuff is inspired. And it's not. Only the Word of God is inspired. Is the Koran, let's give y'all a test here. Is the Koran inspired? No. Let's vote on it. Let's see if we see your hand. Koran not inspired. Raise your hand. All right. All right. We voted negative. There we go. There we go. All right. So we all agree on that. Uh, did you know 600 million people would disagree with you? There's 600 million people that believe the Koran is inspired. There is one good verse in it. Y'all know what that verse is, right? Y'all know what that verse, that really, really good verse is? It's that verse that says, if your wife gives you a hard time, whoop her with a big stick. Oh. Oh. Okay, that was the offense. Fancy like how on a date night. I'm telling you right now, man, is that stupid stuff or what, man? I just, I would love to get on the view. If I ever get on the view, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Whoopi, I got, a, I got a verse from the Koran to read to you. I know how much you believe in uh, If your wife messes up, whoop her with the big stick and pull out a big stick on the big table. I'm telling you right now, man. Uh, so the Koran's not inspired. And look, I'm not trying to pick on people. Uh, most people know that I'm very open to other faiths and beliefs. And, uh, you know, I, I love Methodists. Man, if I wasn't a Baptist, I'd be a Methodist. I talked all about John Wesley Sunday, didn't I, Scott? I love me some Methodists. I love me some John Wesley. I, I'm probably as close to St. John's uh, Catholic Church in DeVille as any Baptist preacher has ever been to a Catholic church. I have sold bottles of wine there. Okay, that wasn't funny. I thought it was funny. It was an auction, and I was an auctioneer, and they got a picture of me holding up two fists of wine, selling them at the auction, and boy, they were trying to... Uh, Blackmail me on that situation. Uh -huh. Anyway, I've had so much fun with people of different faiths. I love Pentecostal. I love Dale Hutchinson. 
you know, and it's just, you know, just a lot of people from a lot of faiths that I've had a lot of fun with over the years, love dearly. But there are a couple of, 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 of uh, denominational groups, if you want to call them that, that really get off the mark when it comes to the Scriptures and Jesus. And those two are the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. And they both have an extra revelation. What that means is, is they have material that they think is inspired. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Only if only the Bible is inspired, then the Book of Mormon is not inspired. Would y'all agree with that? Yes. Man, it's just not. The Watchtower is not inspired. It's just not. It's just a magazine. And a bunch of it's dumb. You know, just dumb, stupid stuff. And it's not inspired. Only the Word of God is inspired. So now that we picked on the Muslims and we picked on the Jehovah's Witnesses and we picked on the Mormons, what about Lifeway materials? Oh. <laughs> are they are they inspired? <laughs> wow. I know it is. Isn't that cool? That was by design. I'm so glad you made attention to it. Yeah, we need to get a cricket app to where we play it when I when moments like that happen. I'm going to tell you right now, Lifeway literature is definitely not inspired. It's good. It's helpful. We use it at my other church. You know, we use Lifeway materials. And some of it's real good. I taught Lifeway materials in Sunday school for years and years. But lots of those years, I would have to begin at the beginning of the class and would say, now look, when me and the writer disagree, Y'all know who's right, right? 100% of the time, y'all know who's right. So, no, Lifeway materials are not inspired. How about the book that I'm reading right now? I'm reading a book to get ready to write my own evangelistic materials. You think this book is inspired? It's a witness and training manual? You know, there's been millions of people got saved because people learned how to use this book. But it ain't inspired. Why? Because only the Bible is inspired. How about the Baptist hymnal? Nope. <laughs> well, you know where I'm heading. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hold it up, Brenda. Hold it up. You got one? Don't have one. You don't have one? Here. Is the Heavenly Highway hymnal inspired? Nope. I can assure you that it is not. Right. You know, and it, if it is, it has mistakes in it. Did I tell y'all my favorite song was Pass Me Not? It's not my favorite song because of how good his theology is. I love Miss Fanny and I love, you know, the, the tune of it. I can hear Alicia Nugent singing it in the background of my head. I can hear Dennis Stewart playing it on the mandolin. It's got some beautiful words in it. But it's not just, it's, it's a little sketchy. Pass Me Not. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. How about the Christmas music? And with the ever-circling years, it came upon a midnight clear. And with the ever-circling years, that's not Christian thought. That's Hindu thought. Whoa! Wow. You're bugging me out here. I don't think it was intentional, do you? Right. No, it wasn't intentional. But the years were not ever-circling. The thought process that the years repeat themselves, the history repeats itself. History might resemble itself pretty regularly, but history is not circular. History is linear. And what that means is that it had a beginning and it's got an end. And there ain't no such thing as with the ever circling years. And so, look, that's two examples. I could give you a hundred. And then I could give you some that just don't make very good sense. How about. Let me, get, let me get my whiny voice in here. Living below in this so sinful world. Go ahead, Scott. Hardly a comfort can afford our padded seats and our AC with a Cadillac in the parking lot. Come on, man! Now, when how about them? How about them contemporary songs they sing at them new weird churches? How about them? How about them churches that put the words on the wall? Them people are gonna lost their mind. Is that stuff inspired? Why the devil? No, it ain't 
inspired, the only time songs are inspired is when they quote the Word of God. And they do that regularly. Scriptures quote the Word of God regularly. And those portions of those songs are inspired. And much of the music is very correct theology. And I would say, now that I've trashed some music, I would say the music writers are better than the preachers when it comes to theology. I would say that. So many of the songs that we sing, they're just, they just hit home. You know, they're just good, good stuff. Well, we've picked on several people here. How about my favorite author? Is he inspired? Old Max Licato? If, if anybody gets a reward in heaven for making people cry when they read, it's going to be Max. On my bucket list, I'd like to see Max. I'd like to, I'd like to meet Max. He lives in San Antonio. And man, I'm telling you right now, Max and Peter can write. But is he inspired? Y'all hit me out here now. Y'all get disengaged. Hang with me and we'll get to eat supper sooner or later. Is he inspired? No. No. No, he ain't inspired. Well, let's pick out something else here. How about my favorite book I wrote? Oh. How about my favorite book I wrote? What do you think, Jess? Inspired? <laughs> I can promise you this is not inspired. You know, I, I used the word sucketh eight times in it. <laughs> promise you, this book is not inspired. It is true, it's correct, and it's brilliant, but it is not inspired. What about, what about, what about my latest book? Y'all see how thick it is? Ain't y'all proud? It's written in crayon. Written in crayon. It's so pretty. Ain't that cool? You think that's inspired? Oh, uh, 14. Yeah. Well, I can't see 14. I just wondered, ain't 18. Anyway, hey, this book ain't inspired. This book ain't inspired. What about my favorite thing that's ever been written? How about my dissertation? Y'all think that's inspired? Negative. No, no. The only thing that's inspired is the Bible. Now it's not a problem until people go to talking about stuff like that. What that guy's inspired, and that's where you, as fully, we don't have to be ugly, we don't have to slap them, we don't have to ninja chop them, we don't have to spit on them or nothing like that. But when they start with that bull that something is inspired that ain't the word of God, we need to balk because the next thing you know, you got junk being called inspir inspired. It's the word of God. The Word of God is inspired. Not only is it the only thing that's inspired, but it's where our revelation should come from. In other words, why do we believe what we believe? Inspired means that God breathed it. That's what it means. And it's so accurate. That just the amazing nature of prophecy. To me, you read Daniel chapter 2, and it's a road map for the next 3,000 years. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable how accurately Daniel talks about the future. Not only did he talk about the worldwide future in a wide scope, I think he's got a pinpoint vision in Daniel chapter 7 of what I call the curtain call prophecy where he's looking at the very end of time and he's looking at nations on the earth during our day and time. I'm telling you now, that's accurate. Isaiah 53. If you didn't know that it was 700 years before Jesus, you would have no idea that this boy wasn't sitting there watching it, just like you know, just like the, the apostles who wrote about it later. You know, there were eyewitness accounts. So the, the thing Isaiah 53 reads exactly as is like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's written hundreds of years. So the uh, MIT people who do the best math. They figured out the probability of the prophecies of the Old Testament being accidentally fulfilled in a specific individual. All right. Do you think it was one in a million? It was way more than that. One in a billion chance that a person could accidentally fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies? Way more than that. It was, one, it was 10 to the 157th power. One of these days I'm going to get a piece of paper 
and write 157 zeros on it. Wow. Here's how one person described it. Here's how one person described it. They described it if Texas was knee deep in silver dollars. And there's one silver dollar in Texas that makes the cut. What's the probability you're going to go pick it up? How many of y'all have been to West Texas? See, I never went to it two years ago. I apologize. Man, that's awful. Can I just tell you, they ain't even got light posts out there. It, you go forever. There's nothing. Can you imagine if the whole state of Texas, when you get to I-10 or I-20 and you're on the west border, how far is it across there? It's like 800 miles. 890 miles. Yeah. I mean, it's forever. And it's just about that long, too. Or, you know, it's crazy how big that place is. Needy silver dollars. And the chances of you hop coming up on one so that's how, that's how unlikely it would be for somebody to accidentally <coughs> fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfilled them all. Say amen we'll go on. Amen. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. And those are just some things, man. We could go on all night, could we, Dustin, about how accurate and amazing the Word of God is. The Word of God alone for revelation. I tell people I, I, it's not original. I don't think anything I is original. If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly, read the Bible out loud. If you want to know that God is speaking, read the Bible. We have too much these days where people are preaching, teaching, sharing, well, God told me this. And God told me that. And if you do that, you and me can be friends, but don't expect me to base my life on what God told you. No offense here. I'm just going to keep reading the Bible if you don't mind. You know, we, we put our, you know, people say, well, God, let you. There are people, serial killers, that said God told them to go out and kill people. Yeah. You know? You, and, it, and the fact is, and look, before we even get really upset, let me just go ahead and say, does God speak to people? Does God lead people? Well, of course He does. Does the Holy Spirit guide people, convict people, comfort people, guide people, direct people? Of course He does. But all of that is subjective. What is the objective is the Bible. And so if I want to get into guesswork, I can listen to what you tell me God is saying. But if I want to take the guesswork out of it, I can get the Word. Yeah. And now there ain't no guessing. Because everything He says is what He's trying to reveal to us. Deuteronomy 18, 20 warns, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And I'll tell you, man, I've seen it my whole life. I was in a, one time I went to a revival that had been extended. Man, got a bunch of people got saved. I mean, it was an exciting time. And boy, me and Clinton, we went, it was in Manny. That's our hometown. We went up there to get in on the revival. The revival. Boy, it was taking place and it was so exciting and everything was so great and things were going on. My wife and I went there. When we got to the end of the service, the evangelist said, I understand we have a preacher from South Louisiana here, Brother Steve Spear. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, uh, hey, can we get you to come up? Uh, all right. I'll come up. And then it got bad. <clears throat> can we get your wife to join us? Oh, Lord, son. That one eight Cherokee fixing to be 100% squall. <laughs> right before she scouts me, I'm going to put her on you. But <laughs> well, anyway, they, they ask us, could they pray for us? What would be your answer? Well, certainly. More the merrier. Pray for us. We had just went through the most prolific year I had ever had in ministry. That year, at the beginning of the year, I told our deacons they wanted to build a new church. I really didn't, but, you know, that's what they want to do. And, and I told them, I said, well, we're going to build a new church. We need about 100 new members. And, they, and I said, we need to pray for 100 new members this year. 
And they said, we, we ain't never had 50 new members. What you mean 100 new members? Well, on the last Sunday of that church year, we were sitting at 96. And I told them in the pulpit, I said, we ain't leaving here till four people join this church. So y'all figure out who it is. You know, y'all figure out who's supposed to join up today. But we ain't leaving here today until four people join this here church. So my good friend, Randy Tyler, I don't know if some of y'all might know him, him and his wife and his six kids walked the aisle at the end of the service. And uh, that was back when I had a brain. I did. I used to have a brain. And uh, he said, well, let me introduce my family to you because I know you don't know us. I said, hold up. Give me, give me a shot at it. And I named all six of his kids. Then him and his wife, that is no longer. Your pastor no longer has that ability whatsoever. I don't know none of y'all, really. So anyway, I'm just kidding. Anyway, anyway, so they joined the church. They made us 102 members. It was a great time. So back to the revival. They're praying, and they're all gathered around us, and here's what they're praying. Lord, we know he's struggling. Lord, we, we know, and we know how... You know, it's been, and we know he's up into some dark times. And Lord, we know how, how much he's struggling right now. That's when I lost a little faith in this. I know what God is speaking and I know what God is saying. Because there were times in my life where they could have prayed that and it had been true. And I'd have been humble enough to receive it. But not that night. Just had a hundred new members. No, I ain't struggling. How many of y'all had? You know? No way, man. And so the whole thing is, is people, I know I'm getting off track here. The people, you know, they want to talk about it. And if you want to hear God speak, re read the Bible. The Word of God alone is our authority. Uh, you don't have to read. Uh, here's what people do all the time for me. They say, man, I listen to this preacher on TV. And I listen to this preacher, uh, you know, on the Internet. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. that you know, nothing wrong with that. But people act like that that's just, you, I can't live without it. You, man, you're just not going to make it until you know what Brother So and so had to say about something. That's not true. I don't need to know what Brother So, I love to hear Fur Tick once in a while. He lights my fire once in a while. I love to hear that guy preach. And he made him look a lot like, don't y'all think? <laughs> y'all don't even know who Stephen Fur Tick is, do y'all? Okay, but we, we, we're twins, man. Anyway, you know, anyway. You old version? I see it. I'm the old version. You know, anyway, you know, I, I like to listen to somebody, and I love to read Max and Caleb. But, but the thing is, is the Bible teaches very clearly, you don't need anybody to tell you and to, to tell you what to believe, you read the Bible for yourself. You study the Bible for yourself. You test everything that you hear about the Bible according to the Scriptures. Like the Bereans who studied the Bible to see if it was true. When Paul and them came to preach, they, they studied the Bible to see if it was true. Guess what they found out? It was true. They, man, they were big fans then. But they checked it out. And so we need to be in the Word, studying the Word. That's what we need to do. You can take a book text. There are 66 books in the Bible. How many of them do you know what they're about? Then we'll just take the index of your Bible. Genesis, what's it about? Exodus, what's it about? Leviticus, what's it about? Numbers, what's it about? Just go through the Bible and see how many of the 66 books that you know what it says. Then there's 1,189 chapters. There's 1,189 chapters. And especially for all the young people. If I had life to live over, that's how I would have studied the Bible. And I could prove it. This little book that I told y'all about, it's a 50-word summary of every chapter in the Bible. I started on February the 8th. And I got through with it about six, eight weeks ago. Then, then I got lazy and it took me a while to edit it. But it's a 50-word summary of every chapter in the Bible. And it's a 100-word summary of every book in the Bible. So the book starts off, and i got a 100-word summary, and then each chapter a 50-word summary. You know, we need to study the Bible. We need to know what it says. We need to study the Bible. And, you know, the Bible alone needs to be our authority. The Bible alone is our guide. The Bible alone is our guide. Paul tells Timothy 
And from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you wise unto salvation. Man, you know my, my, my uh, testimony is exactly like Timothy's. He, his, it was his mom and his grandma that taught him, taught him the Word of God. Uh, today, today, and I know it had to be for a reason. Today, I found my Bible I had when I was a kid. I'd been missing it for two, three years. Now, to be honest with you, I was looking for that Book of Mormon in the Corinth because I wanted to throw them at something, you know. And, uh, and I come across my, my child's dog. I got it from my grandma. And, you know, I know what it's like to be taught the Holy Scriptures and be wise unto salvation. In Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a what? A light unto my path. Paul says false teachings lead to false living. Bad teaching leads to bad living. And then he says, false teaching is like a cancer. It will, it will erode away at everything. It spreads, it's painful, and it's often lethal. The last thing I want to say is the Word of God alone is our treasure. I rejoice at your Word as one who finds great treasure. You know, I often think, what would happen if, some, if a family knew they had treasure. Now, what if, you, what if, a, if you knew a Wells Fargo stagecoach had buried a, a box of gold and come to find out it's in your backyard? The name would be after the digging right now with a tablespoon, wouldn't she? I'm telling you, man. But can you imagine if you knew you had treasure? Man, you'd be written a back hole, man. You'd be, man, you'd be after it, wouldn't you? would dig up your whole yard trying to find that treasure. Well, that's what he's saying about the Word of God. The Word of God is treasure. Right. And that's how we need to pursue it. And that's how passionate we need to be about it. The Bible says that it's like honey uh, is another one. Listen to this. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Okay? So, honey. Do y'all like honey? Mm -hmm. yeah. Honey's good. Ain't nothing wrong with no honey now. You ever had soap of peas and posadas and tree port boats? Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> Slap your mom. <laughs> they got the best salsa. They got the best tacos. They got the best refried beans. And they for sure got the best soap of peas. And you cut open the top. You pour that honey in there. We don't go to supper quick, quick, Jose. I'm going to be in a bind here, man. We're going to get, we got to get the supper table pretty quick. That's some pretty good stuff. Can I tell you, though, that honey is so good, so tasty, but boy, it can't compete with the sweet stuff that we get. Let me just mention three words to you. Reese's. Let me, read, let me, let me say four words to you. Reese's, peanut, Butter. <laughs> Put them in the fridge. Up there where the butter is, because the butter box will hide it. Put the Reese's behind the butter box on the top shelf, and your little five foot three wife won't see it. Don't y'all tell her where I hide my Reese's. I bet she watches. I go to the Chevron sometimes, and so far I haven't caught a single cowboy, not one. I ain't caught a single cowboy buying beer at the Chevron, but I catch them his church people left and right. I tell you, they so they in there and they get their beer and they're looking at me like they want to die. Yeah. Like they want to just shrink up and die. They left to a rapture happen now. You know, when may the world swallow me up? What they don't know is, I'm trying to tell them, what they don't know is, is I'm wanting to do the same thing because I'm in there buying some Reese's. And I don't need to be ratted out neither. <laughs> so I'm trying to tell them over and over again, I won't see your beer if you won't see my Reese's. How about that? Can't we just make a deal on that? How about we just pass each other by and act like we don't even know each other? You know that's what happens at the casino. Baptists don't recognize one another at the casino. And I know y'all just go there and eat from the buffet. I hope you get a stomachache the next time you go. Anyway, what I want to tell you is their honey, their honey is so good. Their honey is so good. But it can't compete.
compete with no Reese's. He can't even compete with a Butterfinger, man. Have what the Bible teaches. I'm making people hungry. I want to just tell you right here and right now, man, the Word of God is so sweet. Oh, man, there are times. Oh, man, my pastor told me what he was preaching last week. He said, I'm preaching on a, a, and then some. Oh, and that phrase captured me, boy, immediately. And I said, what you text? What you text? What you text? He said, you know that parable where the guy works all day and he comes in the house and he says, the master says, well, you know, you, you expect the master to say, well, get in here, boy, you worked all day. Come in here and prop up in the recliner. Let me know that ain't how it works. The, the, the slave works all day. He comes in and then he serves the master. When the master is done, then the slave fixes his own stuff, takes care of his own stuff. I called it the parable of bony fingers. Because when you work your fingers to the bone, that's what you get, bony fingers. And then some. That, that just captivated me this past week. I don't know what's going to captivate me this week, but I can assure you, if I spend very much time in the Word, I'm going to find some honey. The Word of God alone. Spend your time in the Word. Spend less time in books about the Word and more time in the Word. Okay? We worry about what others say about the Word and make up your own mind about the Word. Study the Word for yourself. Okay? Now, let's have time of invitation. Mr. Brennan, if you come, now you thought about this, I put zero on the God. Can you in here? Can you just play something for us? Play a mate, something, play something for us. All right, she's already picked it out. Let's all stand together. If you want to receive God's free gift of eternal life, you come on. If you want to come to the altar and pray, just come on. Whatever God puts on your heart. If you'd like to come and remember this church, we'd love to have you. <coughs>
things you do, but most of all, Lord, we thank you for your Son who died for us. In all his name, things we pray in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.